Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. We've got some sad news. We have to say goodbye to this brother over here. Um, <clears throat> he's uh, flying back to the States on Monday. Um, so it's sad for us, but I thought we'd uh, give an opportunity just to say how's it and cheers. I mean, seeing that we're not meeting at this moment in time, um, we have to acknowledge this brother. He's uh, been such a blessing to us in the church. So, hey, man, Adam. Hey, yeah. Saying goodbye, man. Yeah, I'm flying away. Flying away for one final time. It's crazy. It is. So what's this? I was thinking like third. Is it your fourth trip? I mean, I mean, it's it's about, I think, my fourth or fifth trip. The first one I don't really count because it had nothing to do with Calvary Paul. <laughs> but um, I think this is my fourth time coming back um, and serving the church. So. Oh, I think that's wild. Awesome. And so how are you feeling? Like, leaving it's, Monday? It's, it's a new season. Um, Literally, the past four or five years has been about always coming back to South Africa. You know, even when I was in the States working a full-time job, it was about saving money and heading back to Palm. So <laughs> now that's not necessarily the um, vantage point I'm going back home for. Um, so it's, it's a new season, so I'm preparing for a lot of the unknown things yeah, that yeah. could happen. Um, as much as one can prepare for the unknown. Totally, man. Well, I'm glad, man. And so, have you got any plans? Have you been able to set some things up? Are you going to be hooking up with Bryce when you get there? Yeah, I'm actually going to be heading back to Calvary Chapel, Tustin, the church, my sending church in the States, which is the same church that Bryce is from. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm going to be helping out in their college ministry um, alongside some awesome brothers. And I'm also going to be helping out um, with graphic design there, the same thing that I was doing down here. Um, but there it's going to be more on social media as opposed to working on our website, which we finally got up, our new website, so, yeah. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, man, Adam, you've helped us so much with all the Melding Media. Um, these kind of videos that uh, we've been enjoying over the last four weeks since we are in another lockdown is because of this brother. Um, and uh, it's, it's been super cool. Even the previous lockdowns, all of these kind of processes have kind of like been put into place because Adam's gifted in this way, you know? Um, and so, uh, bro, from us, we want to just say thanks, man. Oh, no worries. But, um, yeah, it's been a little bit of a weird kind of, like, the last couple of four weeks. You've been here for yeah. three months. I've been here for three months. And then, like, <laughs> the last, like, month, you haven't even been able to go to yeah, church, no, you know? Yeah, been interesting. Um, but anyway, bro, I just wanted to, if you've got anything on your heart yeah. for Calvary Chapel Paul, uh, I just wanted to kind of put it out there, bro. Yeah. And share your heart with us. Definitely. You know, I would just um, say for those of you who are serving here, um, lean in full tilt. You know, it's this thing that we, um, when I was back in my um, high school days, when we were running track, that was a big thing for us. Um, usually when you're getting out of the blocks, those little starting things, um, there's this hesitation that you have because it you're supposed, to, you're supposed to feel like you're falling. Mm. You're supposed to feel like you are going full in. And your legs got to go yeah, and catch up with Yeah, you. exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's this measure of faith that you're supposed uh, to have. Momentum forward. Exactly. And I would say for those of you guys who are serving, you know, when you're serving, do that. Lean in full tilt. Don't make your um, plan Bs or your reservations about, well, I'm not sure this thing will be appreciated. You know, we're not working or serving necessarily for... Um, each other or even for um, a pastor or for even just a cause we're serving God and God he loves it when we pursue him in faith and when we serve his people in faith um, just listening to his call and not worrying about oh this may happen that may happen just going full tilt with what the Lord's called you to and serving here at Calvary Chapel Park so, yeah. oh man awesome bro That's good stuff Hey man, well, just from us, we want to just say a, a big thank you, man. Uh, it was your third trip out, and um, yeah, from us as a church, I know we're gonna we're gonna figure out a, a cool way to just say thanks to you on another time. No worries. But um, we'll be back at some point in life. You promise? Years. Come on now. Years. <laughs> years. Years. <laughs> you have to come back for you. <laughs> but anyways, man. Um, yeah, just from us, we just want to thank you, and I want to pray for you quickly. Bro. Please do. Just, yeah. Ask the Lord to bless your next chapter. Father God, I thank you for my brother uh, Adam here, Lord. I thank you for just his heart. He didn't come just once, Lord Jesus. He's come three times to serve here at Calvary Chapel, Paul. And, and Lord, we just thank you for the giftings that you've given him, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for just what he's been able to do as he's 
just jumped into everything, Lord. Magda's soup kitchen, the prison ministry, Lord, even just at the, the night shelter and just being available, Lord. And that's, that's probably the greatest gifting of, of Adam. He's just available, Lord. Just available to do whatever you want him to, him, him to do, Lord. And, and uh, us as a, as a leadership at Calvary Chapel Paul, we want to bless him right now. We want to ask that your face would shine upon him as he travels. Would you just bless him with traveling mercies? As, as Lord, traveling these days is complicated, Lord, and, and just full of little loopholes. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just help him everywhere along the, along the way, God. And, and just even as he goes home and, and uh, he just like, kind of settles down into what you want him to him to do there in the States, Lord. We pray that you'd open up doors for ministry, Lord, and you'd just make things really, really clear for him, Father God. And, and um, yeah, we pray that you'd just bless him now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Come on, bro. See you all. Till next time. Till next time. <laughs> Come on now. All right. We're going to get into our text for um, this week. And you'll see now the camera is going to be a little bit adjusted, so um, don't worry, it's, we, there's no earthquakes or anything like that. So you can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, um, 22, and we are going to finish up this chapter, hopefully, and uh, just look at this uh, cool piece um, where Paul is, last week we saw how Paul has made this amazing uh, preach or a message to the Jews even though uh, he had just been beaten by the Jews. These same Jews that are beating him, he's kind of like giving them the gospel. But um, I, I don't know if um, when you've been going through this book, this awesome book called Acts, and that's what we do here at Calvary Chapel Paul. So if you are joining us, somebody sent you this video, or you're kind of tuning in for the first time, that's what we do here. We go through books of the Bible. We go through chapter for chapter verse for verse and we just break it open we ask God what are you saying to us and and the cool thing is we've been asking God going through this book of Acts we're going God what are you saying to us you know what do you, what do you want us to learn here and, and I was just looking a little bit back and sometimes I do that in my preparation I just kind of look a little bit back over the last couple of chapters and see from chapter one and how we've now come to chapter 22 and it's and it's definite kind of like we, we're making our way to the end of this book which is really really cool I must actually go and find out when we actually started um, studying this book but we've been in it for a good long time but the the first thing kind of like that that, that kind of kind of highlighted for me is we get to see the church as it originally was you know like the birth of this church right and if you remember we we looked at Acts chapter 1 and it was still like kind of this overlap Jesus hadn't ascended yet into heaven and um, the, the the disciples are still asking Jesus is it now the time that you're gonna bring and restore the kingdom of Israel um, back to us and Jesus is like, no, you're, it's not your time, <laughs> you know. And we looked at it a little bit a while back, and we're like, God, is this now the time that you're going to bring back the kingdom? It would be good, like around about now, it would be really, really nice. But anyway, we get to see this original thing, the blueprint, right? And we get back to basics, and it, and it's kind of like funny because it feels like God's been doing that all over the world. It's just like get church back to basics. Get back into the Word. It's just about gathering together. It's about unity. It's about kind of being connected even though we can't meet together. It's just, it's not about, you know, all the ministries. It's not about necessarily kind of functions and events. And, and it's just about the raw basics. And um, the second thing that we get reminded is that the first thing we see in Acts chapter 1 is that Jesus says to them, is that in um, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and we said like this is kind of like the central verse for Acts. And it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we're reminded as a church that we are led by the Holy Spirit. We are not the church if we, we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. And that the birth of the church in Acts chapter 1, uh, or Acts, sorry, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down on Pentecost, that was the birth of the church. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, 
and we're not led by the Spirit, then we're not the church. And so every chapter, as we've been going through, and now in chapter 22, we're just seeing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit like ministering to the Jews within Jerusalem. Then they go out to Judea, then to Samaria. Philip goes through to Samaria. John and Peter come and lay hands upon the church in Samaria. They receive the Holy Spirit. And then we see... Um, What's his um, name in, uh, in Caesarea then when um, Peter goes out and he has that vision of the, the blanket and, and the Gentiles start coming in. Every little step is led. And then Paul and Barnabas in chapter 13, it says, the Holy Spirit comes and says, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have them to do, to go to the Gentile nations. And they, and they just go. And, and everywhere now, we've been, like it seems like in every little chapter, we see like how the Holy Spirit's just leading Paul, right? And then the, the third thing we see, and maybe importantly for us personally, is we get to see how God works within individuals. How God works in and through, right? And um, we know that as we've been going through this book of Acts, we've seen individuals, how God has used Peter, how he's used John and James and now Paul as we're looking at, even Philip, what about Aquila and Priscilla and the 12 um, uh, elders or disciples in Ephesus and, and in Troas and we get to kind of like see personal application and that's awesome for us because God does mighty things through ordinary people and so as we've been going through this, um, it's, a, it, it's quite kind of unique that we obviously because Luke is writing this this book what we're looking at here is that we see how um, Luke is kind of devoted half of the book of Acts just to the Apostle Paul and so we've been just looking at what he's been doing in, in the Gentile nations right and so I kind of like I said this statement we get to see how God works in and through people right and so I thought I'd kind of like break this down and see last week we saw how God worked in Paul right and he gave this amazing uh, kind of defense he says I'm going to be defending myself and not due to your accusations as the Jews and if you don't know what I'm talking about maybe you just need to listen to the next uh, the previous video and um, what he's he's making a defense but it's not a defense of what they accused him of Right? Bringing a Jew into the temple or um, being against the people of Israel. What he's actually be, uh, here is defending his faith. Right? And he's saying to them, right, um, you know, this is why I believe. And he doesn't go from scripture, Old Testament, improving and getting all academic. He just says, this is my testimony. Right? And we learned last week the greatest defense to our, te uh, uh, to the, our faith right, is our testimony. Right? And so we, we looked at Paul and, and how he said in Damascus he, he had met Jesus and he was totally a changed man. He hated um, Christians. He hated the way. He was persecuting, zealous for the law. And now we see Paul a totally changed man. He's no longer the Paul that was back previously to before Acts 9. Now he's the Paul on fire for the gospel, for the whole nations to be saved. And that's what God does in a person. He changes our lives. And for most of us that are Christians, believers listening to this message, we can go, Amen. Previously, I didn't love God. I didn't even want to worship God. But I didn't even want to be with God's people. But right now, I love God and I hate my sin and I want to be holy and I want to pursue a relationship with God. And we see how God worked through Paul, right? And Paul is right now in, in Jerusalem. He's actually brought all of his cronies. <laughs> can't say cronies, sorry. He's brought all of his buddies that he's made through Macedonia and Achaia and um, Asia Minor. And he's brought them into Jerusalem, right? And he's just showing off in a way the, the evidence of God's grace amongst the Gentiles. And he's just showing off and saying, God, save the Gentiles. Right? And this is what God's done. He's taken Paul and he's gone, sent him to the Gentiles and he's worked through him to bring salvation to so many people. Right, And so then we look at this work and how God has worked. God's ways, right? And I was just thinking, and, and God's ways are His ways and not our ways. And we were laughing last week because... Um, 
Paul, Paul thought through himself as he was talking to the Jews, he was saying, um, God sent him to the Gentiles, but he said to God, no, but I've got the credentials and I, I, the Jews know me and I persecuted the way and I was the one that was stoning, standing a, a alongside as they were stoning Stephen. And so I'm meant to be the one going to the Jews. And in a funny way, kind of like how God works is that Paul, the educated man that he was, he was sent to the uneducated Gentile world. And who did God use to kind of minister to the Jews? He used Peter, the uneducated fisherman, right, from Galilee. And it was just amazing. God, he works in his ways. And Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so the other way is that how God works is that he works through adversity. Things are looking bad, but God is working it for good. And we think of Romans 8 verse 28, which says that, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, right? And so things look bad, this side of heaven, right? Things go wrong, but God is busy working it for good. And Paul's, Paul went through so many um, hardships, but God was working through them, right? And, uh, and right now, we're, seeing, we're going to get into this text. And for us, it's a practical reminder in our relation, in the relationship with God. Things don't just go absolutely hunky-dory as soon as we let God into our hearts. But He's filled us up with peace. He's given us purpose in life. He's linked us with people. And so life now becomes endurable because we've got relationship with Him. We're getting instructed by His Word and we're walking, we're journeying with Him, right? And so as we move towards this text um, this morning, we, we understand that even though God, life is hard and full of um, hardships as we look at the life of Paul, we can always go, but God, but God is busy working. And so Paul is now here in, in Jerusalem and we're going to get into this text now. I'm going to read it for us and I'm going to pray for us. Sorry for the long uh, introduction, but I, I just, I felt that we needed to kind of like have a little bit of a perspective quickly. Acts 22 verse um, 22 to 29, and we're going to read together just those um, from 22 to 29. It says, up to this word, they listened to him and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. And the tribune answered, I bought this citizen for a citizenship for a large sum. And Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. And let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your word right now. And God, we pray that you would minister to us. We ask that Holy Spirit, as we are your church, that you would lead us, God, and illuminate your word to us. And Lord, we acknowledge that this is your words. This is, God, this is your words that you would have us hear today, that you would have us kind of um, break open, and that you, God, would make our hearts obedient to this word. May it bring joy to us and peace and encouragement now. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, 
Verse 22 says, up to this word, right? And so they had been listening to Paul. If you just remember from last week, Paul had been beaten in the synagogue. They had kind of like um, brought him out of the temple. They had accused him of being against the temple, against the people of God. And they've accused him of um, bringing a, a Gentile into the, the temple. And then brought him out and they had full intention to kill him. And as this, the, then the, the, from the fortress of Antonia, this, this um, tribune came down, they stopped the commotion, they were dragging up the stairs, and then Paul was about to, to go into the barracks and says, can I just minister? And he shares his testament. And so he's, he's speaking right up until now, and then he says the last ver, uh, verse in, uh, was, that we studied was verse 21. It says, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so at this, this kind of thought that God would send Paul to the Gentiles and that the Gentiles would be saved, for the Jews, this was, this was heresy. This was absolutely against everything that they believed, right? And we remember that the Jews felt that the Gentiles were good only for um, heating up the fires of, of hell. The Jews, the Jews felt that Gentiles were, were useless. They, they hated the Gentiles, right? And so in their response, they kind of dramatized. They shake off their cloaks and they're shaking off the dust and they're chucking dust into the air. And they're saying, away from this man, he doesn't deserve to live. He should be, be rid, the earth should be rid of this, this Paul, right? And at this moment, the, the tribune was hoping that Paul would kind of bring the commotion to some kind of stop, right? And he says to them in verse 24, he says, um, okay, we'll just take Paul in and we're going to examine him by flogging in the barracks. And we're going to find out, get to the bottom of this. And so the only way that they could, that the tribune kind of thought that we could get to the bottom of this commotion and find out what Paul is, who he is, and what's happening is we're going to flog him, right? And so what happens is, is that when, <clears throat> when uh, prisoners are flogged, it's not like a normal beating. This uh, is, a, is a whip that has uh, got leather strips on it, but on the ends of the strips and on the leather strips, there's pieces of bone, right? And pieces of metal and broken chain and, and all of this. And it's kind of similar to what Jesus endured um, just before going to the, um, to, the, to the cross. And what would happen is, and here we see Paul, Paul stretched out. They've put straps on him and they've stretched him out so he can't move. And his whole back is exposed and there's, he's about to be whipped with the, and flogged until he confesses to whatever he's done, right? And <laughs> it's so funny in this moment is that um, that uh, Paul kind of, in just like, I see Paul like in a coolness, just like in a chilled manner. He's just being stretched out and, um, and he's about to be, to, to be whipped. And, uh, and Paul just uh, says to, to the centurion, verse 25, he just says, Is it lawful for you to flog a man? who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned. And it's at this moment that the whole kind of scenario kind of changes. We kind of saw it was like it, it was from getting bad to worse. And now Paul just says, is it lawful? And he drops like this get out of jail free card, you know, kind of I'm a Roman citizen. Right. And uh, at the, what follows is that the centurion runs off to the tribune and he says, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen. Claudius then comes down. He says, Paul, are you a Roman citizen? Are you really a Roman citizen? And then Paul says, yes. And Claudius is like, I bought this for a lot of money, right? And some uh, kind of Bible scholars saying they were kind of mocking Paul because Paul was beaten up. He looked like a kind of a vagrant. He looked like a kind of just someone that they picked up from the street. And he was saying, well, in a way, sure, citizenship must be getting cheap these days, you know, if you can be a citizen, right? But he's, ba and Claudius is saying, but I bought this for a sum of money. It was as a lot. And Paul just says, well, I I'm, I'm was a citizen of birth, right? And so <clears throat> Paul kind of like is treated all of a sudden, it, 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 they kind of like, to, they kind of like move away from him. And Claudius's heart is full with kind of fear. He's afraid. Because he realizes that Paul is a Roman citizen. Paul was at this moment a, a kind of a condemned man. But now all of a sudden he's now the citizenship is kind of like kind of set him apart. And people are going, the, the Claudius is going, what is going on here? 
you know. And so we should be asking, what is going on here? So Paul is kind of, um, he knows the law. Paul understands, you know, and, and we've seen him do this before because back in, in Philippi, if you remember, him and Silas had been beaten in, in, in public and then thrown into prison. And if you remember, they're singing deep into the night and, um, and, and then there's an earthquake and the jailer was wanting to kill himself and then they share the gospel with him and, and he gets saved. And, and then they want to kind of secretly, the officials of Philippi want to say goodbye to Paul. They can go now because they're uncondemned. They can't find any evidence against them, right? But Paul says, no, you beat us as Roman citizens, uncondemned. You need to take us out publicly. And what happens? The same thing happens there. There's this fear that comes across the Roman, uh, these officials because this Roman citizenship is of such great value. It was totally illegal for you to beat a Roman citizen in those days. Rome kind of occupied the whole known world back then. And Roman citizen was something to, citizenship was something to be valued, right? And so Paul knew this and it was illegal, right? If you were a Roman citizen, you were able to vote, you were able to own land, you got kind of some um, tax, um, you could uh, not pay a full tax, right? And the most important thing is that you were given justice, right? You were able to be, go through a trial and, and they would actually, they would listen to your, to, uh, to your, you know, your trial and they would try you and, and listen to your opinion. So can you imagine being a commoner in those days? If you were just falsely accused, you would be thrown into prison. You wouldn't even have a, a, a trial. Um, there wouldn't be proper justice. But Paul knew this, right? And this Roman citizenship kind of set him apart. And the amazing thing is here is when Paul says, um, this, uh, Paul says, I got this thing for free. I was born into it. And so we realize, get a little bit of a, a picture into Paul's past. He was born in Tarsus, right? And so if you were born a Roman citizen, it means that your father and mother were Roman citizens. And for them as Jews to have gotten Roman citizen, his father would have had to have done something for Rome that he would have been awarded. Maybe... Um, <clears throat> He had served Rome uh, in the military or something like that. But anyway, we find that Paul is, he's actually born free. And this Claudius, he works for Rome and he's wor working for Caesar, but he had to buy this, right? Um, he had to kind of bribe people and officials to get a Roman citizenship. And it's so kind of like topsy-turvy. Here we have this Roman official, he had to buy his citizenship. And Paul, he got it for free. And it's just like the gospel. If you want to look about uh, in Paul's citizenship, Roman citizenship as being a child of God, God it's a free gift from God. We were, we're born uh, into our second birth. We're born and we become um, children of God, right? And so what we see here in this piece, and we're just going to study this piece, is God's sovereignty, right? God's sovereign in this. Uh, it's, it's an amazing picture. Paul was born a citizen. And who would have known that years later, God had intended his citizenship to continue his work in going to appeal his case to, um, to Caesar and share the gospel in Rome, right? That's God's sovereignty. He works behind the scenes. Paul, uh, he had already prepared Paul's citizenship from his birth, right? We also just see that um, a practical part is that Paul knew his rights to perfect, pr protect himself. And uh, even though us as Christians, we're not meant to be um, using, uh, you know, courts of law to kind of um, sue our fellow brothers. But we are able to protect ourselves from the world using our civil rights, right? And uh, in studying, I kind of felt like this, 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 this kind of picture of Paul and his citizenship kind of go down this little rabbit trail. So... Um, Come with me and down this rabbit trail is when Paul wrote this letter, uh, he wrote a letter to the Philippians, right, where he was actually beaten. And um, Philippi was a Roman city in Greece and they were very proud in their Roman citizenship. And yet um, Paul writes to them and he, and he says to them, don't enjoy the rights that come from being Roman citizens. And he says this in Philippians 3, right, verse 17, he says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told, sorry, for many 
of whom I have often told you, and now I tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, and their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. And then he says, note this in verse 20, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to, um, to subject all things to Himself. And so Paul reminds this church in Philippi that prided themselves in their Roman citizenship. And he reminded them, don't pride yourself in your Roman citizen only, right? You're actually a citizen of heaven, right? And so, I don't know about you, but sometimes we forget. We forget that we are children of, of God. And that, therefore, we have citizenship, not only of this country that we live in, but we have citizenship of a whole new world, a kingdom that is not out of this world <laughs> in reality. We are children of God, right? And so, so many times we see in the Old Testament, the children of God, they would, uh, they would be brought into this promised land of which they lived, and then they, they sinned, and, and so they were taken into exile, and, and Jeremiah speaks about how they were in exile to, um, to Babylon, and they were there for 70 years, and the promise was that after 70 years, they would be brought back into the land, the promised land, and that the same picture is for us as Christians living in this life. We, we see ourselves with this dual citizenship, is that we, we live here, but we don't belong here, right? We're in this world, but we're not, we're not of this world, right? And so, <clears throat> this is so exciting for us because it means that this life, it's not all about now. It's not all about this life, right? And we're reminded when Jesus says to Pilate in, in John 18, um, when, when Pilate says to, to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers him, He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. And the realization that we are not from this world reminds us of our mission here on earth. Right? Just like Paul. Paul kind of continued on in his, in his mission, right? And so we have this, I'm in, but I'm not of. We've got this dual citizenship. And I just wanted to share it with us a couple of these verses in the New Testament that remind us that we're not of this world. And, and I think it's what God wants to remind us in, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And any time in our walk with God, we need to be reminded of these things. In Romans 12, um, we know this one so well. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then it says, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, right? And so we, we're meant to not be conformed to this world, guys. We're meant to live for another kingdom. In James 1 verse 27, um, he says that we should keep ourselves unstained. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like we walk through this stained world, right? It's just, it's broken with sin. And, and us as Christians, we, we kind of like, we walk through this world, but we don't want ourselves to be stained by this world. In 1 Peter 2, verse 11 to 12, it says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. And then it says, you're sojourners, you're travelers, you're foreigners in this country. We're foreigners in this world and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. In the day of visitation, I was just thinking about that. It's just that how God is uh, in this moment with Paul, 
and they realize that he's a citizen of heaven in a way that he's a citizen of Rome, they're afraid, right? And our conduct in such a way that we live as Christians, how do we, how do we kind of conduct ourselves here? Do we live in such a way that people look at us and glorify our God, that they are in, in, in kind of like a godly fear of how we live? And then I thought of this beautiful piece in Hebrews 11 of this hall of faith. As we look at all of these guys that, um, that kind of went before us and in the Old Testament and even now in the New Testament, we look at these guys, we go, wow, they lived the life of faith. And it says about Abraham, can you believe it? Even Abraham, the father Abraham, it says, uh, of Abraham, says, by faith he went to live in a land of promise, as in foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And then verse 10 says, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Even back in, in Abraham, his faith led us to him to trust in God because this earthly possession that God was going to give him was nothing compared to the possession, the, the city that God was going to give him. That's, the foundation wasn't made of man, it was made of, of, of God. In verse 13 to 16, it, goes on, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, right? But having seen them and greeted them from afar. And it kind of like displays our whole life. We see this promise, this glimpse of, of heaven. We don't receive it here in life. Heaven is not this side of, 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 of heaven, right? It's, it's, it's here. It's, it, it's on the other side of here, actually. And then um, it says, um, they saw it from afar, and it said, in having a knowledge that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And, and us as, as Christians, we don't, we don't live as if we're going to possess heaven here on earth. We're going to get it on the other side when Jesus comes to fetch us, right? So therefore, when we understand that heaven is not, not here on earth and we don't make this our best lives ever, we, 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 we realize that we, we are actually just strangers. And verse 14 says, for, Peter, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. And, and He has prepared for them a city. And then Hebrews kind of in, the, in, the, in chapter 13 it says, For here we have no lasting. Here we have no lasting city. It's, there's no lasting city here. But we seek the city that is to come. And, and I just think... Uh, as we look at this piece in Acts, I just think we get reminded that our heavenly home is what is sure. This, this land and this time that we live in is, is, is not home, right? We, 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 we are looking forward to our heavenly. Our citizenship is in heaven. And so um, let's pray together and um, we'll end this time in God's Word. Father God, we thank you so much that um, we could get into your Word this morning. Father God, we thank you that we can look at um, Adam and um, we can pray for him this, this morning. And we can be encouraged by his journey, Lord. And, and just even though we think of him as an American citizen, he came to live in this, in this uh, South, African, uh, South Africa. And, and God, we, we get to say cheers to him this morning and bless him, Lord. But God, uh, even though he's going back to his hometown it's not it really is home lord he's still looking forward to heaven lord and for us right now lord we want to be reminded we so want to be reminded lord that we are not citizens of this world lord we live to another master and god you are our master jesus you have set the standard of how we live that we shouldn't live as those that are, 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 are contaminated by this world but those that are free from the strains of this world. And so God, please do that in us. And as we uh, look to your table, as we look to you, Jesus, and what you've done to kind of, you have purchased this citizenship. The citizenship of coming into heaven is, it, 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 it couldn't have been done without you, Jesus. And so we honor you to Jesus today and we praise you for what you've done. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just really encourage your saints, Lord, your children, that, Lord, we, we shouldn't live as those that are, that are permanently here, God. 
but Lord Jesus, we live for another city whose foundations and, and its designer is not in this world, but is outside of this world. And we, so we thank you, God. Lord, we, um, we just uh, we thank you for this time now. We pray that you would please bless your church. For those that are struggling right now, Lord, please, Lord, bring, their, bring your peace upon them, Lord. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So you guys have a great Sunday. And uh, remember, if you uh, need prayer for anything, please won't you reach out. Um, uh, my email is jeff at calvarypal.com. Um, uh, it's jeff with a G, G-E-O-F-F. -F. And so um, please email me. If you have my number, please reach out. It's difficult in these times to stay in community and stay connected. But please um, reach out. And so have a blessed Sunday. Love you guys.